أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعين به ونتوكل عليه ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق وخاتم الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين نبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وذنون إذ ذهب مغاضبا فظن أن لن نقدر عليه فنادى في الظلمات أن لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين فاستجبنا له ونجيناه من الغم وكذلك ننجي المؤمنين أمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم For the purification of the souls, the enlightenment of the hearts, for the acceptance of the deeds, and for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior, عجر الله تعالى فرجه الشريف, enlighten your souls, purify your hearts with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Respected sisters and brothers, elders, viewers, Salamun alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. This is a dua that saved the life of the Prophet of God. It's one of the most favorite supplications of scholars and those seeking to unravel the mysteries of the soul. And it is one that the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised those who recite that he will come to their help and assist them. The dua of Prophet Yunus is a tremendously powerful supplication and one that has been described as the soothing words for the soul. It's truly a dua that those who have discovered would not wish to abandon, continuously reciting, continuously remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with it. It's a dua that is found in Surah Al-Anbiya, chapter 21 of the Holy Quran from verse number 87. The words were uttered by this great prophet of God by the name of Yunus, Jonah, well, whilst inside, of course, the belly of the whale. Now, those who seek to refine the soul, purify the heart, they want a, uh, a journey of self-discovery. Those who have had enough of the shackles of this dunya, the shackles of the sins, the darkness that sometimes strikes a human being enjoy reciting this dua find that it is soothing find that it brings about tranquility it is one that evolves and produces a feeling of elixir of sweetness and happiness in its utterance especially when it comes to sujood prostration before the almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala it's a dua that comes highly recommended from the Holy Ahl al-Bayt Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'een. No doubt it is something that will benefit you and I like every supplication. But as we said, these du'as of the Qur'an, they truly change the world and they can change you and I. The whole objective is to continuously look for whatever needs to be done to make those transformations, to make the development. Stagnation is no good. To stay exactly how we are is what is not what we are recommended to achieve and establish in our lives. We need to advance. We need to look far beyond and seek any means of reformation, seek any means of enlightenment. It is not sufficient for us to be content with whatever state we're in. I must be of the seeker of further light in my heart. I must ask questions. I must listen. I must learn. I must develop. I must communicate and supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the keys to do so is these magnificent supplications in the Holy Quran. 
Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al Sadiq, sallallahu wa sallamu alayhi, is narrated to have said in uh, the book Man la yahdharahu al Faqih by Sheikh al Saduq, radhiallahu ta'ala alayhi. He says, Ajibtu liman ightamma kayfa la yafrah ila qawli Allahi subhanahu ta'ala. He says, I'm surprised the one who's going through hardship, the one going through depression or sense of uh, difficulty, um, wanting to give up, how can they not be happy when they come and read the verse of the Holy Quran, La ilaha illa and subhanaka inni kuntu min al-dhalimeen. Why? He says, For inni sami'atu Allah azza wa jalla yaqul fastajabna. Imam al-Sadiq says, according to this narration, because I heard Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala say, immediately due to this particular recitation of this dua, that what? That we have answered, we have responded to the call. This is why, because of this fastajabna lahu wa najjaynahu min al-gham, we have responded to him and took him out of the hardship. وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And likewise, we will do so for the believers. You'll find a great number of our scholars, our ulama, or the mystics, urafa, those who seek the light of the heart, those who wants to know, who want to develop ma'rifah of the nafs, so that they can know the Lord, hold on to this uh, dua and this dhikr known as a dhikr al -yunusi. They feel it's a treasure they cannot let go of. They feel it's something that is so profound, it's so detrimental, that it's something that they're constantly reciting. It's uh, part and parcel of their lives, they will never be able to abandon it or actually leave it. That's why, for example, you have uh, some scholars like Sayyid Ali Qadi Tabatabai Radwanullahi Ta'ala Ali. He is the one of the well-known mystics. He used to live in Najaf today. If you, inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you all tawfiq to visit the holy city of Najaf and Karbala and the shrines of the Masumin alayhim salam. When you go to um, Wadi Salam, this is perhaps perhaps the world's largest uh, cemetery uh, and certainly one of the most important in Islam. Uh, there is a, a resting place and a shrine for Sayyid Ali Qadi Taba Taba'i. He's the teacher of Ayatollah uh, Allama Taba Taba'i. And uh, he was very well known to be a very simple person in the sense that he was not pompous, he was a God fearing individual. Sayyid Ali Qadi, it is said that you know, he would make an effort to recite it 400 times every day. This La ilaha illa ant, subhanaka inni kuntu min al This he would recite this number of times to highlight its importance. Another of our great scholars, Ayatollah al Kashmiri, uh, he would say, Afdalu amanin lissalik as sajda wa dhikru yunusi. The one who is seeking to go onto this journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the best things they could do is in prostration they recite this dhikr of Prophet Yunus alayhi salam. And then he would recommend, if you have hawa'ij, and who amongst us doesn't? How many times we get asked the question, you know, I have, uh, you know, unfulfilled wishes i have so many issues and challenges in my life i would like help i would like allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to provide me and to grant me the fulfillment of my wish how many times we've been asked for dhikr quran dua supplication anything out there this is a one recommendation that exists and that is after each salah which is wajib, so Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib and Isha, to recite 400 times La ilaha illa ant subhanaka inni kuntu min al for 40 days. So for 40 consecutive days, 400 times La ilaha illa ant subhanaka inni kuntu min al and it is recommended by one of our well established ulama. Another of our maraja whose shrine uh, is uh, very close to the shrine of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam in Najaf Ayatollah al-Uzma al-Sayyid Abdul A'la al-Sabzawari ala Allah ta'ala maqamah one of the urafa and one of our great scholars um, if you know this road known as Shara al-Rasul where his eminence Ayatollah al-Sistani hafizahullah lives and it is directly you know one of the uh, roads leading towards the blessed shrine of Mawla al-Muttaqeen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam if you continue on this road on the right hand side there is a very well built mosque Masjid al-Sabzawari it's known 
and it is where the shrine of this blessed scholar is found, Sayyid Abdul A'la as Sabzawari ta'ala He says, you know, if you have difficulty, if you know you can't get married or you're having issues with your marriage, or for instance, uh, challenges relating to your children, business, security, every morning the first thing that you should do is recite a hundred times La ilaha illa ant subhanaka inni kuntu mina um, and it becomes a habit that's fine that is good that is recommended for you and I to develop this habit of actually um, having this dhikr constantly purifying our mouths and fragrancing it what is interesting is that our ulama have recommended that the desire of the heart to recite it should be there not just the oscillation of the tongue this goes hand in hand with the understanding that this dhikr and this supplication is profound if it is uh, mentioned with the knowledge of what is it that we're saying with an understanding of the background of it somehow an attentive heart a heart that is in sync with what the tongue is actually saying. And that is why uh, Ayatollah al-Ulma Shaykh al-Bahjat Allah ta'ala maqamah, another of the scholars of the mystics, he says, uh, as you desire food, your heart should desire dhikr. And, you know, the food differs. You won't have the same food every day, he says. So likewise, the dhikr differs too. Subhanallah, if you think about it and just pause for a moment to reflect on this particular statement by this very well-established scholar and arif, you realize that what he is saying is there needs to be some kind of uh, affinity with what that we, what we are saying. Uh, in Dua Kumail, Famously, Amir al-Mu'mineen wa mawla al-Muttaqeen Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says uh, and addresses Allah tabarak wa ta'ala Ya man ismuhu dawa wa dhikruhu shifa So that communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a source of healing both physical as well as spiritual. Now, let's have a look at this particular dua of Yunus alayhi salam. I want to be able to look at so many dimensions of it as much as possible to be able to analyze uh, what um, is it uh, regarding this dua that's so key? And I want to have a look at this uh, in look in in analyzing three questions, and that is to understand Prophet Yunus alayhi salam and what Prophet Yunus had to do and what he uh, how he was tested, but also this dhikrul Yunusiya. What are the actual main tenets? And finally, the tenets. How does it apply to the lives of? Uh, you and I. Now, of course, this great prophet of God, Prophet Yunus alayhi salam, is an individual who's been mentioned across the Holy Quran. And in particular, you'll find that he's found in across four chapters of the Holy Quran in Surah Al Safat, Surah Al Anbiya, Surah Al Qalam, and of course, a chapter named after him, Surah Yunus, chapter 10. And it's a story that, of course, is also found in other scriptures revered by other uh, religions. For example, we see that in both the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, they prefer uh, they refer to a prophet by the name of Jonah. And in the Old Testament, he's referred to as uh, Jonah, and he's found in the book of Jonah, of course. But, but as the case with so many of these glorious individuals whom we revere and respect, when we look at these books and how they show them, it leaves a lot to be desired. What does it say? What is the story of Jonah in, for example, the Old Testament? Well, it says that he was ordered to go to a city known as Nainawa, probably in modern day northern Iraq. And he had to uh, prophesize about the punishment of God. But it says that instead, he disobeyed and go, went to a place known as Jaffa, which is today's uh, city known as Tel Aviv. 
um, in the sea, the story of the swallowing of the whale is actually found and it is narrated. Um, and after he uh, is sent to uh, Nainawa again, and this time he does go, he prophesies his destruction in 40 days. People repent in prayer and God, of course, the Almighty spares the city. Now, the Bible tells us that Jonah is displeased. He leaves the city thinking it will you know, receive punishment. Then there is a conversation uh, regarding this between him and the Almighty, uh, glorified and exalted he is. And the book of Jonah uh, tells us that, you know, this particular uh, conversation um, was not necessarily pleasant because Jonah himself was um, somehow complaining to God, unhappy why God the Almighty did not punish his community um, in, in, in this particular manner. This is unacceptable, of course, in our teachings because, um, you know, we look at Ahl, uh, the Ahl al-Bayt and, of course, before that, the prophets in great light. We respect them, we revere them. They are God's chosen servants. They are messengers. They have been selected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for you and I to benefit from, to learn from, to be looked at as exemplars for people that we can really learn lessons to apply in our lives. In the Holy Quran, therefore, when you look at the comparison between how Yunus alayhi salam is mentioned in the Holy Quran and, for example, in the Old Testament, you'll find that in Surah Al-Safat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 139, al mursaleen in Surah Al-Qalam, verse number 48, Allah says, فَاجْتَبَاهُ رَبُّهُ فَجَعَلَهُ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ Not only one of the messengers was Yunus, Allah specially selected him and made him of the righteous individuals. And what else? The story of Yunus السلام, is also very unique. Why? Because it is his nation who were the only ones that were actually spared the punishment by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they submitted and they believed. It was in the area of modern day Mosul, of course, where the demolished shrine of Prophet Jonah Yunus alayhi salam exists. It was the uh, enemies of humankind, Daesh, who destroyed his blessed shrine in that area. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, allow us to see one day his shrine rebuilt, inshallah, one time soon. He was a descendant of Prophet Hud السلام, and came before Isa approximately 825 years. <coughs> and he was sent uh, and preached for uh, about when he was 30 years old and he continued to preach for about 40 years. But people, of course, were stubborn. They would say, our forefathers did whatever they did. We will stick to it. Um, they had a, an idol by the name of Ashtar. And they used to worship this particular idol. Yunus السلام, came with the message the same as other prophets, isn't it? That uh, you have to worship Allah and worship Allah alone. They argued that, you know, this is not what we're supposed to do. We will only uh, do what uh, we have been told. They mocked at him. They laughed at him. Only two people believed in him. One is known as Tanukha. He was the uh, Abid servant. And the other was known as Robel, who was known as the scholar, the, uh, the Alim. And he eventually, when he saw that people were turning against him, Yunus السلام, decided to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to punish his community. And Allah wa ta'ala accepts it and told him that, you know, there will be a time, a date where the adab, the punishment will fall onto your community. He left angry with his people because they did not accept the teachings of Allah wa ta'ala. They rejected Tawheed and monotheism and therefore he left disappointed with them and took with him whom? Tanukha. Who is Tanukha? It was the Abid, the worshipper. Of course, there's two people out of thousands to believe is extraordinary, isn't it? And you look at these prophets of God. It's amazing. You know, their stories are so filled with so many challenges and hardships. But despite the small numbers of people supporting them, you did not find them give up. You did not find them coming to God and saying, what is the point? You're wasting our time here. No, they were determined, they were committed. It doesn't matter, one, two, one thousand, ten thousand. 
I have to do my job. I have to present the teachings. I have to guide those towards uh, righteousness and uh, God-fearing attitude. But remember, they are teaching us an important lesson. They are telling us it's not about numbers. It's about quality. Here, Yunus salam had two. He had this Tanukha and Rabil. They were both one, you know, believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But despite the disappointment of uh, uh, Nabi Allah Yunus alayhi salam, he did not complain against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He complained against his own community in the sense of why and why are this community rejecting the clear manifest truth? It was so evident before them. And of course, he leaves at the shore when he left. He saw many people and he embarked on a ship. And, you know, there's two opinions. One says there was a, a flood or, uh, you know, a turbulence. And, uh, you know, people thought that has bad luck. Others say there was, they saw a whale, which was hungry. Anyway, they decided that one of them had to jump into the water. And they drew a lot and his name came out three times. This name um, was constantly coming out. The Quran says, and of course he submitted to this. He didn't say, look, you know, I'm a special person. That's it. My name has come out. I have to uh, uh, do what I promised you. He was of course swal swallowed by the whale. There, there is the divine Amru Taqwini, the generative will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in which he would direct towards the fish that, or the whale that do not crush his bones. Uh, do not tore his uh, flesh. And the Quran says, فَالْتَقَمَهُ الْحُوتِ The hoot, the, the whale swallowed him. So it didn't crush him, didn't affect any of his bones. How long did he stay inside? Well, according to Amir al-Mu'mineen, it was nine hours in a narration. Some other narrations say up to three days. But whatever it is, it was a miracle without a shadow of a doubt, since we cannot stay alive inside the belly of a whale for more than a few minutes, let alone hours or actually days. And it is not a surprise, my dear sisters and brothers. The Lord that saves Ibrahim from the fire and Musa from the sea can save Yunus from the whale as well. And of course he did. Inside the darknesses, the three layers of darknesses, the night, the sea, being in the belly of the whale, he asks and he supplicates to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah wa ta'ala, of course, helps him. He is then uh, released into the, um, an island, a barren land. And he was ill, naturally, you know, inside, quite acidic, maybe environment, not suited for the human being, no exposure to light, no, nothing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is testing him. Narration says that he was so weak, like a small chick that has just been born. The skin was being shed. He could not bear the sun. He could not move. Allah wa ta'ala says, then I helped him. And we made sure that the, this gourd plant, this shajaratul qar, you know, this yaqteen uh, tree that was very helpful. It had big leaves, it cools. It, 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 it somehow pushes away insects and uh, was given to him somehow. He was able to find it somehow. It protected Prophet Yunus alayhi salam. And then, وَأَرْسَلْنَاهُ إِلَىٰ مِئَةِ أَلْفٍ أَوْ يَزِيدُونَ The Quran says, um, we, you know, sent him back to his community. Meanwhile, of course, whilst Yunus alayhi salam was inside the belly of the whale and he was going through all this, <clears throat> they saw signs of the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala approaching. The nations tell us that the clouds would darken and they asked for Yunus but they couldn't find him. And then eventually they left the city for the outskirts and asked Allah sincerely for Tawbah and said we believe in what Yunus alayhi salam bought. <clears throat> and of course uh, with them was the alim and he taught them and Yunus alayhi salam returns successfully to lead his community. So that was the story in the background for us to appreciate what has happened. And very interestingly, um, Yunus, just to mention to you a beautiful narration that I found regarding his father. You see, this is linked to the whole subject of dua. Let, please focus on this. This is very, very important because Yusuf, Yunus alayhi salam's father, his name is Metta. And he lived at the time of Prophet Sulaiman and Prophet Dawood, his father. 
And in the narration, Dawood asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I want to see uh, my companion in paradise. So Dawood and Sulaiman reached, you know, they traveled, they reached a particular city and they asked for Metta. They heard that he was, you know, a righteous individual, uh, possibly Allahu Alam, maybe a prophet even. Uh, when they reached, they told uh, he was told they were told that he's cutting wood in in the in the forest. So they went, they observed him sell whatever he had cut, then accompanied him home. On the way, he used the money to buy some flour. He placed this flour after you know making it uh, uh, appropriately with water into a dough, and he placed it into an oven. Then he sat on the floor. He got the bread out, he put some salt on it and said Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, then ate and said Alhamdulillah. And after each morsel, he would say Alhamdulillah. Then he drank and said Alhamdulillah, finished and he said Alhamdulillah. Then he said the following according to the narration. He says, Ya Allah, you have given me so much ni'mah. You know, I, my eyes have seen so much blessings. He says, my ears have heard so much blessings. My body has come across so much reward and blessings. And you gave me strength that I went and I cut this tree. And then I sought my rizq. And then you found me somebody who would buy the wood. And then you allowed me to find food with this. And then you provided me with fire, which I can then prepare the bread with. And then you gave me the ability to taste and to eat it with desire, the food, so that I have energy and strength to worship you. Falaka alhamd. Therefore, glory be to you. Thank you, O Allah. I am expressing gratitude. Sulaiman is looked at by Dawood. Dawood says, Ya Bunay Qum, Fansarif bina, let's go. فَإِنِّي لَمْ أَرَى عَبْدًا قَطْ أَشْكَرُ لِلَّهِ مِنْ هَذَا I have never seen a man who is so grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like this man. Salam الله عليه. Metta, the father of Prophet Yunus alayhi salam. Now, let's examine then the tenets of this dua. Because remember, it is a dua. It's a dhikr, but it's a dua. Yunus alayhi salam was inside the valley of the whale. He supplicates to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says, I answered him and I will answer the believers also. There are three main areas into this dua that we need to appreciate. The first is known as tahleel. La ilaha illa ant. So much power in testifying the oneness of Allah jalla wa ala. Al-Rasul al-Akram wa nabi al-A'zam. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam in a famous narration says ma min al kalam kalimatun ahabbu ila Allahi azza wa jal min qawli la ilaha illa Allah there is nothing more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than somebody saying la ilaha illa Allah wa ma min abdin yaqulu la ilaha illa Allah yamuddu biha sawtuhu that no there is no servant that will extend his voice in saying La ilaha illallah illa tanathara dunubuhu tahta qadamay which then results the Prophet of Islam is narrated to have said in the book Thawabul A'mal he says it will result in their sins falling under their uh, feet under their body kama yatanathara waraqu shajari tahtaha just like how leaves fall under the tree itself this is the power of La ilaha illallah. You know, there is a famous dua. You must have recited it. Or if you haven't, then please do recite it as much as you can uh, when it comes to the cemetery, visitation of those who have left this world and are waiting for us to present them with gifts. When we go to a cemetery, we say, Assalamu ala ahli la ilaha illallah. Min ahli la ilaha illallah. Ya la ilaha illallah. بحق لا إله إلا الله كيف وجدتم قول لا إله إلا الله You are the people of لا إله إلا الله We are the people of لا إله إلا الله For the sake of لا إله إلا الله We are asking you how did you find saying the statement لا إله إلا الله This is from أمير المؤمنين ومولى المتقين علي بن أبي طالب صلوات الله وسلامه عليه 
هذا بوك جامع الأخبار هي سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم يقول I heard the holy messenger of God may the peace and blessings of the almighty be upon him and his family من قالها إذا مر بالمقابر غفر له ذنوب خمسين سنة anyone who passes by cemeteries and recites this Allah will forgive for them sins of 50 years I just have to mention one thing here we come across these narrations many, many times. And we often wonder, wow, if I say this in three cemeteries, that's like 150 years worth of the noob, then I'm okay now. Everything is fine. What's the problem? I don't have to worry because all my sins are actually forgiven. No. You see, if today I have the tools to make and to cause fire to happen yes for example i have the match i have the wood and i start i want to start can a fire start yes will it definitely no there are conditions that need to be fulfilled maybe the wood mustn't be damp maybe there shouldn't be any kind of strong gale force winds for example these conditions that are normally prohibiting for the um actual fire to start may not be there and we should not be there in order for this to uh, happen that's why we are told that these narrations when they say it's 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 saying there is potential there is a, an opportunity there is something that can be done to ensure that the sins are actually forgiven this statement my dear sisters and brothers is all about Tawheed. La ilaha illa ant. And not only this, it is so powerful because Tawheed is the most important pillar of Islam. We have, you know, the dimensions of Tawheed are, you know, Tawheed al Tawheed al Sifat, Tawheed al Ibadah, you know, Tawheed of essence, Tawheed of attributes, and Tawheed of worship. But in this instance, it is argued that. This La ilaha illa ant speaks about a unique expression regarding monotheism and that is the return back to Allah. You know how many times we recite Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon We are from Allah and verily surely to Him we will return. Returning back to God um, because there is none to return to other than Him. You know, look at this, uh, you know, interesting uh, parable that is given a child when they are screamed at by the mother usually comes back to her have you noticed um, you know usually comes back to her because there's no one else to go back to right so uh, similarly we are told that even when we are turning away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we still want him we still need him we still have to go back to him وَأَنَا يَا سَيِّدِي عَائِذٌ بِفَضْلِكْ هَارِبٌ مِنْكَ إِلَيْكِ This is in Dua Abu Hamza Thumali. Ya, O oh my master, I run away from you towards you. Let me say that again. I run from you towards you. Because I have no other choice. I need to be empowered that way. Allah wa ta'ala in chapter 9 verse 118 tells us of the story of the three who run away from the Almighty, but they had to come back to Him because they found no other way. Those three did not wish to join the Prophet of Islam وسلم, in Tabuk. They thought, they came to the conclusion, there is no way for me to be far from God and to run away from God except to be next to Him. So this realization they managed to see in their lives. And this is Tawheedul Ma'ad, beautiful expression. This is known as Tawheed, the, the whole idea of monotheism going back to the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the second is Tasbih. In uh, the second part of this dua, yes, so La ilaha illa, and just before we move, and so much to say, just La ilaha illallah could have been said. 
But why would Prophet Yunus and Allah wants us to mention this La ilaha illa ant? Who are we to speak to Allah in this way? Allah Taala says, I'm close to you. I answer you. I want you to speak to me like an intimate friend. Someone who, you know, you're so accustomed to. La ilaha illa ant. Because when you say to someone, if they're not there, you can't say to them, for example, nobody is like you. Because they're not there. Who are you talking to? You mentioned their name. Here, Allah says, La ilaha illa ant. Because you're supplicating, you're speaking, you're emptying your heart. You're talking from the essence. The second area, my dear sisters and brothers, is tasbih. In Islamic theology, the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the attributes and characteristics of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala are divided into sifatul jamal wa sifatul jalal. Sifatul jalal are the absolute perfection, attributes of absolute perfection. What do they mean? They, they are the attributes that lead to us understanding that Allah is kamalun mutlaq. That everything is perfect in every sense of the word. You know, the world that he has created, the plants, the animals, life, um, will, all this is perfect, does not have any deficiencies. Now, Sifatul Jalaliya, you know, are the ones that we, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be somehow described with because it leads to deficiency and shortcomings known as Safatus Silbiya, the negative attributes because he is transcendent above them yes he is all powerful almighty in this instance I'm saying Subhanak so first part La ilaha illa ant second part Subhanak this is the second part of the dua of Yunus alayhi salam inside the belly of the whale it's related to my deeds. Why am I saying Subhanak? People commit sins. They don't perform duties. They blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He doesn't allow me to pray, they say. He doesn't allow me to wear hijab. He, you know, makes me watch these videos at haram. Okay. When I am saying Subhanak, I'm saying, Ya Allah, it is not you, it's me. It is the admission of one's own shortcomings as, as opposed to the might and glory and the power of God. Exalted you are, Subhanak. You are exalted above any form of you know, blaming or attribution of uh, evil being somehow linked to you in that sense. And it is all about quashing the ego, breaking the idols within, humbling ourselves, Subhanak. Now we move on to the next part, and that is admission of guilt. Inni kuntu min Look at, I am, you know, when we say, I am exalted, you are, I am one of those who has oppressed themselves. Look at dua e kumail, for example. فَأَنَا عَبْدُكَ الذَّلِيلُ الْحَقِيرُ الْفَقِيرُ الْمِسْكِينُ الْمُسْتَكِينُ Look at Dua Abu Hamza. Ana alladhi akhtaat, ana alladhi janayt, ana alladhi iftarayt. I'm the one who transgressed. I'm the one who passed all the boundaries. I'm the one who made the mistakes. I'm the one who sinned. It is so important, my dear sisters and brothers, in our journeys in life, that we have to be harsh on ourselves. We have to introspect. We have to be condemning ourselves from within. Never should we be content and satisfied with what we have done. Never should we be happy with whatever we have achieved. We should always think that we are the ones who have shortcomings. This is the spirit of these du'as. This is how we can ensure that these du'as transform us, make us better human beings so that we can change the world positively. There is no changing the world positively if we are arrogant, if we are self-centered, if we think we own everything. No, no, no. This is a recipe for disaster. The first act of disobedience of Allah was because of this. So, once we have committed sins and we are sinners, we are carrying these burdens on our shoulders. There was once a man who um, for 40 years would be performing ibadah and worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he didn't feel this ibadah at all. And one time, he thought to himself, maybe all these 40 years, I have not done the ibadah sincerely. Maybe I have messed up my life. Maybe I'm to blame. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
would you know place this intuition in his heart or perhaps in his dream he saw a malaika. He says that one admission of guilt is much better than the 40 years. Allahu Akbar. It is so empowering. The more humility, the more annihilation of the ego and the self, it is interesting how we can become better human beings in that sense. In Al-Kafi Sharif, in Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, he says there was a man from the people of Khurasan, um, you know, he met Imam Sadiq. He said to him, to Fidak, I have not been blessed with a child. So go back, Imam Sadiq says, to your family. And before you approach your wife, you recite this Chapter 21, verse 87. And you will see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant you a child, and He did, and He was blessed indeed. So there is a very important recognition here, finally. Once we appreciate those three levels, we can come to a conclusion that is beautiful. We approach this dua with desperation, with a heart that is so sorrowful because of all that we have done. But not one that loses hope, not the one gives up, not the one that says, who cares, you know, who cares, or I'm never going to be forgiven. No, full of anticipation and positivity and light. I can do it. I can achieve success. I can become a better human being. I can allow this dua to transform my life. Why? Because it says, وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ You and I are desperate for this light. You and I may go through so much pain in our lives that we need help. Allah says, I want to help you. Come to me with the right prescription. Come to me with the right words. And you'll see wonders and without a shadow of a doubt these are some of the wonderful lines in the holy quran that the ahl al-bayt would use in their duas imam al Hussein al-shaheed salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi would mention this dua in dua arafah i remember in the plains of arafat on the day of arafah reciting this dua and telling all those hujjaj with us recite it again and again, and again, La ilaha illa ant, subhanaka inni kuntu min al -zalimin. And it was also Imam Zain al-Abideen, al-Sajjad, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, would include this dua in dua Abu Hamza as well. It was beloved to Ali Muhammad, something that they would mention, something that they would constantly recite. We as those following them must also memorize it and also understand it and recite it as frequently as possible. Because when you look at a salah known as Salatul Ghufayla, highly recommended salah to perform between Maghrib and Isha on a daily basis, recommended for Imam Sadiq salam in narrations, it will ensure that we inherit Jannah. Darus Salam, this salah in the first rukah, we recite this ayah. Wa dhanuni idhahab mughadiban, fadhan an lan naktir alay. Fanada fadulumat Allah ilaha illa ant. Subhanaka inni kuntu min al zalimin. Indeed, it was the ahl al bayt who would not abandon recommended salah and mustahab salah. They were the masters of the remembrance of Allah at all times, hardship and ease. Come to Karbala and see the demonstration of the love of the Almighty, the ishq, the remembrance like no other. You look at that night, Shami Gharibah. Wallah, anyone sees a fraction of the masaib of that lady and what she saw, what she endured, would break down, would not wish to live a moment of this life. I ask you, just reflect for a moment. You and I, love our family members. We respect our family members. We protect our family members. More so when it comes to our own children. One of our child children, if they're ill, hospital, medication, sleepless nights. For a mother to see the lifeless bodies of her sons, 
the apples of her eyes, the ones who have not yet seen this world, not even married, not fulfilled their ambitions in this world, and in which way, torn into pieces, and yet not shed a tear, this heart was so strong in the remembrance of Allah. Salam Allah ala umm al masaib Zainab, wa ma adra kama Zainab. That night, Shami Gariba, she would sit, she would perform Salatul Layl, despite all the hardships and difficulties, she would remember her Almighty Subhanahu Wa Taala, and would feel a sense of empowerment through the dhikr and salah. And when she would finish the salah, she would look around. One narration says she saw one of the children of Imam Al Hussein missing. She went onto the battlefield of Karbala amongst the bodies, but she knew where to find that child. Sukaina bint al Hussein, this 13, 14 year old daughter of Aba Abdullah, was sitting next to the headless body of Hussein. Allahu Akbar. Zainab would come next to her. The narration says they heard something. They heard, Shi'ati mahma sharibtum adbama in fadkuruni. O oh my Shia, whenever you drink any water, especially cold water, the water that quenches you, remember my thirst. O oh, Sami'atum bi gharibin, O oh, Shaheedin fandubuni, fa ana sabtu alladhi min ghayr jurmin dhalamuni. If you hear of a, a slaughtered martyr, if you hear of someone who's fallen, Remember me, because I am the grandson of the Prophet. Without any crimes, they killed me. Allahu Akbar. And Zainab would then, before leaving Karbala, would sit next to the body of Aba Abdullah. What did she see? What body did she see? Ya Allah, that body that Imam Zain al Abidin could not pick up because it would fall into pieces. She places her hand under the body, looks up to the heavens, and this is the dua of Zainab. Ilahi, taqabbal minna, hadha al-qurban. Ya Allah, accept this qurban from us. Ala la'natullahi ala al-qawm al-zalimin, wa say'alamu al-lazina zalamu ayyamun qalabin yanqalibun, wa al-aqibatu lil-muttaqeen, wa inna lillah, wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Raise your hands, let's pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For the sake of these holy nights, Ya Allah, there are mu'mineen and mu'minat who are suffering with illnesses, ailments, coronavirus, other conditions. They need our du'as. Let's supplicate to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, five times with this ayatul mubarakah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Amman yujibu al-muthtarra idha da'ahu wa yakshifu al-su'u, Amman yujibu al-muthtarra idha da'ahu wa yakshifu al-su'u, Amman yujibu al-muthtarra idha da'ahu wa yakshifu al-su'u, أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءَ أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءَ يَا اللَّهِ اكْشِفْ مَا بِنَا مِنْ سُوءَ شَافِ مَرْضَانَا وَمَرْضَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بِحَقِّ مَرِيضِ كَرْبَلَا زَيْنِ الْعَابِدِينَ May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your deed, fulfill your wishes, make us of the people of the du'as and the Qur'an, and uh, raise us with Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad on the day of Qiyamah. وَأَخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَصَلِّي وَسَلِّمْ وَبَارِكْ عَلَى رَسُولِكَ مُحَمَّدٍ الْمُصْطَفَى وَعَلَى أَهْلِ بَيْتِهَا الطَّيِّبِينَ الطَّاهِرِينَ